Chapter Thirty One of the Story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty One. Without seeing Alice, Roland and Bruce left together in the morning for the bush. Though he saw at once that the boss did not want to make any reference to the night before, Bruce could not let it go at that, and as soon as they had cleared the kitchen grounds, he said he wished to say something about it. Go ahead, then, said Roland, uncomfortably, looking in front of him. But I've nothing more to say. I said all I think about it last night. Something about this blunt discouragement and the boss's comical discomposure amused Bruce. He laughed, but rather harshly. Upon my soul, Tom, do you think you can finish up things like that? Good God, you must have done some thinking to come to this, and some suffering. And all I want to say is, I know it, and I thank you for it, and I thank you for feeling about me as you do. There are things that can't be put into words, and I don't try to put them there, but common decency demands that one show something occasionally. And whether you like it or not, I'm going to say I understand and appreciate your attitude. The unemotionalism in his tone relieved Roland, who was more pleased by his words than he could have showed. He was perfectly willing to be praised. His childish vanity was capable of lapping up oceans of honeyed words. But he did hate anything that upset his comic opera view of life. That's all right, he grunted. There are things I could say if I knew how to say them, but I can't. All right smiled bruce he saw he would have to find other ways of showing how he felt about it if any such were left him all day his thoughts reverted to the boss and to his curious inconsistencies he speculated about his mental processes his preoccupation with action his absence of any power to analyze motives or tendencies roland had always appeared to settle things easily guided by some secret spring of intuition that took him straight to the conclusion while other people wrestled painfully with their souls about it. Bruce had always admired his inexhaustible fund of common sense, and he suspected that it was his common sense, combined with his sense of fairness rather than any reasoned philosophy about morals, that had brought him to the point of view he had with regard to himself and Alice. When they returned to the bay on the third evening, Ross and Lynn were staying to dinner, and nothing in the situation was allowed to obtrude itself upon that meal. Bruce noticed, however, that Alice seemed dull, and that she looked at him from eyes that gave signs of sleeplessness. Afterwards, Roland took Lynn off to one of the timber vessels to see a captain who had some good stories to tell. Asia and Ross disappeared. Telling Alice that he had to finish up something at the store and would be back presently, Bruce also went off down the path. When he closed up the office about half-past eight, he found the lovers sitting outside on the tramway waiting for him. "'Come on the beach a minute. I want to ask you something,' said Asia. Wondering what it was, he turned with them. They all walked the few yards to the end of the cliffs in silence. But as soon as they reached the sandy beach and were screened from sight, Asia stopped. "'What is the matter with Mother? Has she found out about us?' she asked, her eyes fixedly inquiring upon his face, looming over her in the dark. "'Why do you ask?' he returned her questioning look. "'She has been dreadfully worried for days.' You have been away, so you haven't noticed. I don't know of anything else that could have upset her, but I didn't want to say anything until I was sure, for I would have preferred to wait till Alan went away. But if she's found out, we both feel we would rather talk it out with her at once. Alan insists on doing his share of it. Then Bruce saw that they had both screwed up their courage to face the trying ordeal. He looked away from them, but even in the dark they were conscious of the smile that lit his eyes. Uncle David, why do you look like that? As he turned to them again, they realized that he had something to tell them. Asia, my dear, your mother has known about you and Alan from the beginning. She knew you were going to him that day you left for the mythical Haywoods. She knew when she got you the linen and the jelly. He saw plainly how astonished they were. What do you mean? exclaimed Asia. Just what I say. She has known all along, she repeated. She has. And you knew she knew. Well, why not? He smiled. Asia and Ross looked at each other and back to him, and back at each other again, saying nothing but thinking the same things. Did you tell her? She asked, after an eloquent silence. I did not. Then she only suspected. No, she really knew. There are some things you can't keep from the people you love, you know. His eyes still smiled at them. She knew. 
she repeated slowly looking at ross then she knew when she met us at tea and dinner all the time i can't believe it and we thought we were so smart at putting her off the scent we were so careful how we behaved how we looked at one another and she knew uncle david really she broke off seeing that he was enjoying her amazement and after all you were the deceived party he drawled your poor benighted out-of-date mother was clever enough to fool you he wished alice could have seen their faces at that moment ross looked humbly at asia i always felt there was something about your mother we were missing he said with a flushed face she turned to bruce i think you ought to have told me about this before she said crossly but he was obviously amused why should i you know i have never talked back and forth between you and your mother you thought it best she shouldn't know and she thought it best you shouldn't know she knew and there you were what was i to do ross nodded his understanding asia looked down at the sand and dug her heels and toes into it for some minutes how does she feel about it then you can tell me that now her eyes searched his she's left you both on the lap of the gods he replied quietly he was amused to see that these two people who had been so sure of themselves so ready to defend their rights and principles should be so subdued at this information there are more things in heaven and earth horatio he quoted lazily and to that they had nothing to say i would talk to her about it when you feel like it went on bruce looking at her you might find out something if you did and i have come to think it would be a pity if you went away without knowing her then he said good night and left them it was not until they had talked for some time that asia remembered that the cause of her mother's recent worry was still unaccounted for there's something else she said puzzling about it i wonder what it is i'm willing to predict dear that there are things that you will never know about that mother of yours said ross bruce found alice as usual outside her window they had not been alone since they had said good night by the gate after roland had thrown his book of revelations at them he began without any preliminaries my dear i have just learned from asia that you have been badly worried while i have been away she came to me to know what was the matter with you i gave her something else to think about now what do you mean by worrying i can't help it david he felt rather than saw that she was torn still by indecision and he knew that after all he would have to help her to settle it leaning forward he peered up into her troubled eyes you must put what tom said out of your mind he began firmly i told you then and i tell you again that i will never let you do anything with a doubt in your mind i believe you will always have a doubt in your mind about living with me that is the end of it for me it must be the end of it for you for uncertainty would put a strain upon us at once now to help me as well as yourself you must stop worrying about it she looked away from him through the creepers into the night he did not know that as she sat so still she was overwhelmed with a passionate desire that he should carry her off and force her to do the thing she could have done in no other way for that mad moment she wished he was not the masterpiece of insight and control that he was she thought that once the initial plunge was taken she could settle down to the compromise with a fairly comfortable conscience it was the plunge she could not face but if the responsibility had been taken from her she felt she could have been carried along on the wild winds of adventure with a fierce joy her heart cried out against its long years of hunger and suppression it beat against the bars of training and tradition but even while it raged it realized that it would succumb in the end to something that chained it as she sat still and tense struggling with intoxicating visions bruce took out his pipe and began to smoke something about the sight of his pipe always restored her sense of proportion she realized that they were not a cave man and woman but a pair of persons on a veranda with a group of innocent children in the house behind them and all the other appurtenances of a well-regulated environment she knew she was not finished with mad moments but she guessed that they would always trail off into safe periods of submission you will say something to tom said bruce turning to her he saw that he had brought her back to earth rather suddenly oh yes that is i may not say anything but i will write him a letter that will be easier she stammered late in the evening she asked him to what roland had referred when he mentioned his reason for thinking they wanted to live together bruce told her and they saw that it was natural that he should have come to the conclusion he had about it when they said good-night they both wondered if this was indeed the end of their beginnings 
if they were not destined for the peaceful ways of middle age. Neither of them could see that there was anything left to happen. Alice lay awake most of the night wondering what on earth she was to make of the rest of her life. She could not understand why, now that she seemed to have disposed of almost all the things that could hurt her, she should remain restless and unsatisfied. She was at peace and would remain so, she knew, with her husband. She would keep her beautiful spiritual friendship with David Bruce still unspotted from the world. And however much she might relapse in mad moments, she knew that was the only way for her. She was resigned to Asia's plans, resigned to losing her, resigned to seeing her go her own ways, whatever those ways might turn out to be. But all this resignation left her stranded on a desert strewn with the dry bones of a misadventure, with no finger post to point the way to the high places of a new experience. It seemed to her that her life stretched out before her a drab and colorless thing fading off into a vacuous old age, wherein she would continue to play her ornamental part, to dress up for dinner, to play the Lady Bountiful, to sit out so many evenings in the week with David Bruce, to play his accompaniments less and less ably every year, and to be to her girls some sort of a pretty picture of nice old motherhood. Listening to Asia and Alan Ross that summer had been responsible for much of her intellectual unrest. It was not only her physical energy that had been restored. The Weltgeist that was moving hundreds of thousands of women of her age all over the world to repudiate an ornamental middle age had got her. She had been stirred by the eager talk of Asia and Ross about socialism and the labor movement. Indeed, their interest in such things at a time when she would have expected them to be oblivious of everything but themselves had had a good deal to do with her changed attitude about their unconventional ways. They had talked with design to distract her attention from themselves, but nonetheless they were in earnest, and their enthusiasm affected her more than they knew. Alice had always known that there was a good deal wrong with the world, but she had had no idea that it was in the awful mess it was till she heard Ross and Asia outline its horrors of unemployment, wage slavery, and economic inequalities. She had paid little attention to the subject before, though she had listened to many a fruitless argument at her own table between Roland and some passer-by. When she had asked Bruce questions, he had answered lightly, knowing she was not really interested. She had unconsciously adopted in the matter her husband's point of view, judging from his business success that his opinion must be of value. She had seen that there was little to reform at the Bay, for apart from occasional emergencies, it was one of the most prosperous places in New Zealand. Though Roland snorted at the very word socialism, feeling that its advocates planned to kill just the kind of brains and initiative that he himself possessed, he had been a most generous employer, often paying more than the standard wages, charging only a nominal rent for his cottages and land, making little on the cost price of the goods purchased by his employees at his store, and lending money without interest to those of them who needed to borrow. He had built the school and the dancing hall, had given and prepared the football and the cricket field, and had never opposed a single improvement asked for. No employer in the colony had taken more precaution against accident, or had provided more safeguards for his workpeople. When socialism was mentioned in his presence, he naturally pointed to his community as a convincing example of the benefits of capitalism, as if that settled the subject for the whole world and for ever, and he always resented and fought in ways at his command such socialistic legislation as was proposed from time to time by the government. So Alice saw, as she lay awake that night, that the bay had little need of her awakened desire to start something. She saw that she would continue to sit upon the carefully dusted chairs, to give out the school prizes with a gracious smile at the flushed, upturned childish faces, and to be a charming hostess to her husband's clients and distinguished visitors, and to be to the working people that vision of refinement and righteousness that had once been a source of pride. And she saw that every time she got a letter from Asia in Sydney, it would bring home to her her own futility, and she saw that not a week would go by, in spite of all her efforts, without her wishing she could go to David Bruce with all she had to give him. So it was no wonder, after such a night, that Alice was not ready in the morning to give to Asia's discovery the importance that in Asia's mind it occupied. Asia, too, had slept little. She thought over the whole summer, seeking to have a complete picture in her mind. She was deeply hurt and humbled to think that she had failed to see how much her mother had altered. She hated to think she had been so absorbed in herself that she had not seen things that she felt must have been obvious. 
she determined to talk to her mother at once but now that she was not buoyed up by the thought of principles to defend now that she had to play the ignominious part of trying to explain her own misunderstanding she was for her uncertain and uncomfortable she screwed herself up to face it with two cups of strong coffee and guessing the time when her mother would have finished her breakfast she walked into her shut the door and sat down on her bed facing her alice did not even see that she had something important to say mother asia plunged uncle david told me last night that you know about alan and me that you have known all the summer yes i i have known said alice lamely with almost the air of having been detected in some questionable occupation then she wondered why asia wanted to bother her about it at that moment she was almost too tired to think she looked back at the girl sitting in her fresh blue print dress as if she were something on the wall she did not notice the significance of the look in her eyes or of her unusually uncertain manner her dispassionateness startled asia who saw her face outlined against the pillow as if it belonged to someone else for once she felt as if her tongue were glued to the roof of her mouth she did not know how to go on you have known all the summer mother she repeated looking down at her hands then alice saw that the advantage was hers but she was so little of a player of a game that she did not know how to use it she could only look at asia wondering why her sureness and decision had deserted her she felt no sense of triumph at conquering even for a moment so redoubtable an enemy in the battle of wits yes i know i understand she said simply as if she had disposed of it long before and wondered why the question should have been reopened then asia saw that something else had swamped the importance of her behavior in her mother's mind for a moment that was a shock to her vanity but she was quick to see the pathos of the whole situation and she was determined to show her mother how she felt about it mother i didn't know you knew i have misjudged you i would have told you if i had thought you would understand i didn't want to deceive you i thought it was the best way i had to do it you could not have stopped me and i thought it was better to wait she stopped feeling that she was saying something superfluous that her mother knew it already my dear i think it was better to wait now we can talk about it quietly i could not have talked about it at first it hurt me but it does not hurt me now i see it all differently i have learned many things this summer i shall never worry about anybody again i shall never worry about you or what you do i know you are going to sydney i shall not worry about that now you see that i have altered alice had looked out of the window as she spoke in dull even tones but with her last words she turned her eyes upon asia with a sad little smile then she saw that she had astonished her you're surprised she asked questioningly then to her amazement asia fell forward on the bed with her face in her hands never for years had alice seen her shed a tear and she did not see why she was crying now she stared at her golden head in that unprecedented position for some seconds before she spoke what is it what's the matter she asked stupidly asia made an effort to control herself she sat up wiping her tears away with her hands despising weakness in herself she was ashamed of this breakdown mother what has happened to you she asked trying to steady her voice to me alice looked at her and away again why nothing i just see things differently and that was all that asia could get from her that morning but the conversation thus begun lasted with breaks and interruptions for a week an illuminating week for asia she had always loved her mother she had always passionately admired some things about her and passionately deplored others she had suffered more in her sorrows than she would ever suffer in her own she had prematurely matured in the grim crucible of her mother's experience she had always known that her mother had had a tragedy in her youth she had always believed it to be the tragedy of some worthless husband but she could not see why it should have been allowed to darken her life and she blamed her introspective temperament for much of her reserve and her fear she thought all the things she did not understand about her mother were accounted for by that temperament they asked each other no personal questions asia volunteered a lot of information about herself and ross what they meant to do how they proposed to live but at the end of the week she was no wiser as to what it was that was troubling her mother or had been troubling her there was a curious ebb and flow of emotion between them that week 
Sometimes they felt very near to each other, and then something dropped like a wall between them. Alice felt she had got Asia back again. How, she did not know. But Asia felt at times that she had lost her mother, and it was she who now made the advances, who tried to follow into that lone land of intimate personality that is created out of pain, and the thoughts one thinks in the terrible hours before a slow dawn. But at the end of the week, though they were not yet clear as to what it was that had happened between them, as to how far it was an emotional or an intellectual change, they did feel an immense gain in mutual interest. Alice saw that Asia now asked her questions with a real desire to know how she felt, and the subtle flattery in this was afterwards one of the pleasant memories of that groping week. End of chapter 31「thirty two of the story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two The sun was setting in a sky cleared by recent rains and fresh winds, which had carried off the smoke clouds and left the hills sharp against the horizon. As Alice waited on the veranda for Asia to tell her that dinner was ready, she watched the colours flame up and deepen in the sky, and as she watched them, she felt again the curious vacant feeling that had haunted her during the day. She wondered why the departure of Ross and Lynn two days before had left the place so empty, and she knew that if she noticed it as much as she did that Asia must have been feeling it much more. The Australians had had a part in her awakening that summer. They had been interwoven, unknown to themselves, into the new material of her aroused interest in the world about her. She had been stirred by their vitality and their enthusiasm. She had begun by resenting them. Now she was sorry to see them go. She had been ready to sympathize with Asia, but she soon saw that she desired no appearance of mourning. To be suppressed in this direction gave Alice a strange feeling of the artificiality of their relations. She had been in the mood to go deep, but Asia had preferred to dabble in the shallows and pretend she was unconcerned, and that she was not lonely. This was because she was afraid her mother would over-emotionalize anything that she might say. All day Alice had had a suspensive feeling which she remembered vividly afterwards. She had wondered how she would get through the month or so before Asia left, and still more how she would live on the years ahead. But the thing that troubled her most was that with David Bruce still left to her, as much hers as he had ever been, she should be afraid of the future the spiritual friendship had filled her life once now she could not understand why it did not fill her life now as she watched the mackerel sky change from gold to rose she saw david bruce coming along his path and she was glad that he would be there to dinner she went down to the gate to meet him is tom coming she asked knowing they had been together in the bush he said he was when i left him two hours ago he mounted the steps beside her i gave him the letter this morning david you did he smiled i wondered what was the matter with him why what oh he was unusually quiet that was all they sat down he began to tell her of a cave one of the men had discovered the day before in the bush as he talked they heard the beginnings of a rumble about the base of pukikaroro and turning their heads they saw a load of logs break from the low bush and come on down the tramway that will be tom he said and brushing aside the thought that the boss was driving too fast he continued his story. There may be some valuable greenstone in it. It's an old burying place. His head shot round and he sprang to his feet. Startled, Alice jumped up with him. The dull roar of the trucks down the hill had suddenly ceased. An instant's sharp silence was followed by a crash of splitting wood mingled with the snapping and jangling of chains. There was one short echo round the bay, and then a piercing stillness. Straining their eyes, they could see nothing for the load had disappeared behind the rise. "'My God!' muttered Bruce underneath his breath, as he sprang down the steps. As he swung through the gate, he saw that she was following. "'You stay here,' he commanded, looking into her frightened eyes. "'I'll let you know as soon as I can.' Asia and the girls rushed through the house as he spoke. Waving them back, he started to run. "'An accident?' Asia looked at her mother's white face. "'Yes,' said Alice faintly. "'On the line.' Asia knew that no man but Roland ever braked a load down so long after knock-off time. 
she looked after bruce racing to his shanty for his first aid case she saw men rush out of the kitchen and out of the cottages and along the road over the slope that hid the foot of the hill from view she saw bob hargraves and others dash out of the store and run too she saw women gather in groups on the paths mother i'm going and i will come back to tell you go inside all of you asia knew she had a right to go because she had helped at many an accident and had bound up many a cut and broken bone but she wondered even if she ran if she would be of any use there had been two wrecks at the curve with men driving recklessly one of them had been killed outright and the other had died in a few hours there had not been wanting predictions that tom roland would some day pay the penalty of his carelessness mechanically alice led the girls indoors and asked them to give the children their dinner and take them outside then she sat down in the sitting-room to watch for the first sign of a messenger she could not think and she did not try to but though she could neither imagine nor anticipate a fierce excitement burned her roland was more than halfway down the hill driving recklessly but not dangerously before he saw a group of children on the track at the curve below him the utmost care had always been taken to keep people off the tramway and during the day a guard was stationed at the tool depot at the foot of the hill to watch the coming and going from the school every family had been warned and there were signposts at frequent intervals but after hours the precautions were not taken as only the boss drove late and that but rarely this evening the children of bob jones the head contractor returning from a birthday party at a neighbor's house were not known by their parents to be near the line roland jammed on his brake but at the rate that he was going they did not hold he yelled at the children and the eldest a boy started to run for he knew they had no business there but the two girls clutched each other paralyzed with fright and stumbled and fell between the rails roland saw that he would be on them before they could get out of the way as the brakes did not grip there was only one thing to do wreck the trucks and jump for it he saw that and knew the risk but he did not waste a minute hearing the yells bob jones had rushed from the veranda of his house close by a clump of bush trees that had been left standing because they were ornamental hid his children and part of the line from his sight but as he ran he saw roland swing a loose chain end down in front of one of the hind wheels he saw the load rise over it and sway and keel over he saw the boss's feet catch as he tried to jump and he saw one of the two big logs strike him and carry him down and pin him to the earth it all happened before he had had time to cry out then he saw his crying children saved with only a few yards to spare god he groaned realizing the cause of roland's madness in a sudden reaction he swore frightful oaths at his terrified children and roared for his wife who had run after him to get them away then he ran madly for the tool shed at the curve the first runners from the kitchen and from adjacent shanties reached him as he was dragging out the heavy jacks and levers and they were about to raise the load when bruce reached the scene the men worked like maniacs but with faint hope for one look at tom roland's face which had fallen clear and was unscarred told them the truth the rest of him was under the log something that the most hardened bushman dreaded to see and when it was after a few desperate moments bared to their sight that terrible lump of clothes and flesh and crunched bones drove most of them to blasphemy to stop the shock of nausea that curdled their stomachs but every voice was stilled as quickly as it had been raised no one of them had ever seen bruce overcome before and when he sank on the ground and dropped his head into his hands the men set their teeth on their oaths and a hush fell upon them a hush that was broken first by the sobbing of bob jones who began to cry unashamed as he told how and why the boss had done it in a minute there was not a dry eye left and other men running up looked and saw and broke down too asia ran up to the group unnoticed she was the only woman present and her eyes were the only ones that stayed dry with one glance round she took it all in but though she was shocked and sickened she could not cry she was by no means heartless but even in that moment she saw that it was a fitting way for tom roland to die that it was the way he would have liked to have died and in a flash she remembered what his death would mean to her mother and david bruce then she looked at him still sitting with his head in his hands she saw that all the men stood helpless 
stunned as such men are seldom stunned and that they were all waiting for bruce to raise his head and lead and when at last bruce did raise his face almost every eye was upon it they all knew that his role and sole partner bruce was now their head but they were not thinking of their future under him or fearing changes so far as they were able to think at all they remembered the whispers that now and again had arisen in the past and died away just occasional remarks that roland was away a lot and made things easy for his wife and his foreman just vague suspicions arising out of nothing but the situation this and the influence that he had always had over them made them all turn to him there were no signs of tears upon bruce's face but there was a desperate calm upon it the result of a fierce struggle for control he was white under his tanned skin and his eyes looked as if they had tried to retreat back into his head but what he had been thinking no man ever knew he saw no one in particular as he got to his feet but he was attracted to the man nearest him whose shoulders were still shaking seeing that it was bob hargraves he put his hand on his arm a minute then he looked at one or two others meeting strangely unfamiliar expressions in familiar eyes get the stretcher boys he said hoarsely with the words his lips trembled and he stood still struggling for composure while sobs broke out again around him then when he raised his face he saw asia as he walked up to her everyone drew away from them you see he said looking calmly into her eyes yes i see what shall i tell mother there was nothing in her tone or eyes to show that she thought of more than the obvious elements in the tragedy just tell her that he has been badly hurt he answered quietly i will come as soon as i can i will have him taken to my shanty he gave no more sign than she did that there was anything to think of but the effect of his death upon others they both thoroughly understood that any expressions of personal sorrow were unnecessary asia turned to hurry back she felt much more than she could have showed a sense of shock at the sudden cutting off of so vital a creature as tom roland but she felt as if it had no connection with herself she did not even see then that it was pathetic that she should have lived for years in more or less intimacy with a person whose sudden death could rouse no more feeling than relief she did not pretend that for herself it was any occasion for mourning she could only feel his death in its relation to others her thoughts ran far ahead of the present as she ran homewards her mind became rapidly possessed by speculation as to what it would mean to her mother what difference it would make to her home she wondered at once how soon she would marry and made up her mind to influence her mother to be unconventional about the time of waiting the more she thought about it the more excited she became she knew roland had died worth a good deal that the quiet way they had lived at the bay was no criterion of his wealth she knew david bruce was his sole partner and sole trustee she knew there would be money for all of them and she foresaw that her mother would find herself suddenly rich as well as free she met alice at the gate he's very badly hurt mother she said breathlessly uncle david can't tell how much at present stooping down she pretended to take a prickle from her skirt she had no desire to pry into her mother's soul or to embarrass her by anything that looked like curiosity we had better get the children away asia went on raising herself they could stay at the hargraves to-night and go to the king's to-morrow the house will have to be still i'll get the bed ready and so for the moment she threw her mother off the scent but a few minutes later when alice stood in front of the dining-room window to watch the procession come over the rise she saw that it did not come on but turned by the kitchen towards bruce's shanty the swift suspicion that darted into her mind was mingled with a sense of shame that it was a matter of habit david bruce should be saving her again she saw that the quickest way to get to the truth was to go after it herself while asia was telling so much to betty and mabel and getting some of the children's things together alice went out of the front door and ran to the side path one of the men who saw her coming told bruce he met her halfway there was still no room in his mind for more than the sense of shock and some realization of the grief of the people who loved tom roland when he had sat sickened with his head bowed he had seen what it would mean to alice and himself and seeing it had dismissed it as something that could wait he felt no more than this now as he looked at her but he saw that she was feeling something besides anxiety my dear you must go back he began gravely there is nothing you can do and you cannot see him yet 
but she looked at him suspiciously david i will not be saved she cried i need not see him if you say not but he is to come to his home then something about his eyes told her what is it tell me the truth david she said very quietly it is the last time he will ever come he said with a sadness he could not help but feel he is dead even though she had thought it had hoped it and was ashamed that she had hoped it it was a shock now that it was put into the hard frame of words the full meaning of it she could not realize she could not do as asia had done let her thoughts run on into the future in bruce's eyes she saw nothing personal and in that first moment there was nothing personal in her own she did feel even that death was a thing so much bigger than the desires of any two people that it would have been sacrilegious to obtrude personal feeling upon it she felt nothing but the shock of a life cut off a sense of blackness of inability to move or think i can't think clearly yet he went on quietly it will be a dreadful shock to everybody the men and all i shall have to think for others you understand that the light in her eyes grew sharp with the first glimmer of realization yes she said her voice trembling i understand bruce took a folded letter from his coat and handed it to her your letter it was in his vest pocket he said eloquently a flood of tears blinded her she sobbed helplessly don't cry for that he said gently then a question formed in her mind she wondered what had caused the accident if he were driving recklessly because of a mood brought on by that how did it happen she choked he died well my dear he wrecked the trucks to save bob jones's children who were on the line he did that her eyes dried as she spoke and there was a new quality in her voice bruce guessed that the manner of her husband's death would greatly affect her feeling about him and her life with him in the past well my dear he never was a coward was he he asked they looked into each other's eyes though they could not possibly pretend to each other that they would rather roland had lived they felt that in dying like he had he earned regrets that they would not otherwise have experienced in coming into their freedom go home now he said after a minute i will come as soon as i can but i shall have to go round the bay first then alice looked firmly at him david he is to be brought home please at once there will have to be an inquest he said doubtfully and the whole place will want to look at him his face is all right and there is no reason why they shouldn't see him if they want to but you couldn't stand that i can and will stand it she cried mrs layman may want then she shall she answered passionately his eyes lit up at her and then grew grave again all right he said gently i will have him brought home you had better get the children away yes asia is doing that with one straight look in which neither of them tried to show all they felt they turned knowing that now that the future was theirs there need be no unseemly haste in seizing it and that for days at least they would both have to think of others End of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of the story of a New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three. Late that night, David Bruce stood alone in Bunty's room beside Tom Rowland's body. Outwardly, it looked like any other body laid out beneath a sheet, except that there were no hands to fold upon the breast. Bruce and one or two of the men had had a sickening task trying to make it look presentable but they had succeeded so well that there was no aggressive sign of the mangled thing it had been the white face looked extraordinarily dead lacking the fierce eye-fire of the living man only his reddish hair now dulled with grey bristled still as if it would make a fight for life his square jaw was set in death as it had been in life but there was a pathetic sensibility upon his strong features that now softened his expression a something of appeal that arrested bruce as he leaned over him to pin the handkerchief to the pillow since the body had been carried there no one but bruce had seen it alice knowing she could not bear to look upon him stayed in her room asking asia to see that she was left alone not even bruce was to be admitted to see her that night asia broke the news to betty and mabel who remembering only their father's more generous and cheerful years were stricken with his first contact with death and went to bed to cry in each other's arms they were only too glad to be assured by asia 
that no conventions required them to look upon their father's body asia saw no reason why she herself should see it she would have done anything for it that had to be done in the name of decency and respect but she could not pretend that she had any sentiment to spend upon it bruce went in for more reasons than one he knew the body had lain alone and he had sentiment about it he had just come from going round the bay he had visited every family had talked to most of the men and had given such consolation as he could he knew that if tom roland's body had lain in any house but his own it would have had a weeping crowd about it all night long that the only dry eyes were those of the two women who had known him best and that while every other home about the bay was crushed with shock and helplessness with grief here there was already a sense of immense relief and the beginnings of readjustment this aloofness of his family from him in his death struck bruce as one of the saddest things that he had ever known the fact that he understood the reasons for it did not make it any the less sad he knew well enough that any show of feeling on the part of alice would have been indecent all she could do was to be still but he himself had been the boss's friend curiously partial though that friendship had been he had not yet recovered from the shock of seeing that dominant thing wiped out in an instant it still seemed incredible that it should be gone he realized that the stillness that hung over the house was more than the stillness of death that it was also the stillness of the passing of tom roland and thinking of it he wondered what roland's death meant to himself apart from the freedom it gave to him and alice he did not feel personal grief of the kind that makes one wonder how life is to be faced without the friend now gone he felt as if some landmark he had cared about with the affection one can bestow sometimes upon an inanimate thing had been suddenly destroyed by a storm he had the sense of loss one has at missing a familiar object that one has had around for years it was more physical than mental roland's energy had always been a stimulus to bruce like a strong wind ever blowing and forcing one to move with it bruce surveyed their partnership as he stood there they had had a certain kind of intimacy that went deep that had rarely found expression in words it was the understanding of two men male animals for the physical problems they had to face tom roland had always felt that david bruce understood as no one else did the goad of his own rampant vitality for that understanding there was little he would not have done for his partner but only on the evening in bruce's room had any evidence of feeling on the subject come up between them now bruce knew that the boss had loved and respected him with probably the finest feeling that had entered into his mixed emotions their business relations had been their common ground of interest in the main they had agreed about their plans and they had readily compromised where they differed they had the same sense of justice and of fairness they had respected each other's judgment they had been amused at the same things in the men and at the same incongruities in the happenings of everyday life business had inspired them with a mutual admiration for work well done for promises promptly kept for adjustments honorably made for problems pluckily met and solved in all their years of association they had never had a dispute they had been a splendid working team bruce had supplied more of the ideas than any one ever knew but he was more than willing to let roland have the spectacular part of putting them into effect bruce was interested in the idea roland in getting credit for the result both had been satisfied intellectually they had never met as far as bruce knew the only book the boss had read in years was the letters of a self-made merchant to his son he had never had any ideas for humanity such improvements as he had made at the bay were those of the benevolent despot who finds a vast emotional satisfaction in the praise and gratitude of immediate dependence roland had loved doing good only where he would be sure of getting the eye shine and handshake in return the great movements of the world had left him not only untouched but absolutely ignorant of their tendencies and power but he had met what he called the fads of young people without hostility with a good deal of tolerant amusement and with the remark that they might as well do what pleased them for a while because he was certain that as they grew older life would round them up and put them in the safe line of sober judgment though roland had responded apparently without forethought to his own impulses he had been generous as far as bruce knew in dealing with the results he had paid well for his fun 
and he had kept his respect for the women and girls he had lived with having as his one radical accomplishment a single standard for the sexes he gave women the right to do as he did and when it came to the supreme test of his philosophy he was prepared to take as he had shown the same stand towards his wife these things david bruce thought over as he looked upon him and he wondered that with so much known so much should still remain unknown about him after fixing the window and seeing that nothing would rattle or blow about if a wind rose he went out locking the door behind him he found asia in the dining-room waiting to give him something to eat they began to talk at once of how they were to manage the inquest and the funeral and not a personal word was said then bruce lay down as he was on the front-room couch as they all lay awake they could hear at intervals the sounds of hammering on the spit where the head carpenter and his staff worked all night on a labor of love the coffin the most elegant coffin the bay had ever seen made of the choicest bits of mottled cowrie from roland's private collection as asia thought and remarked only to bruce the boss would have been delighted with the stir caused by his death glorified details of his dying were telegraphed all over the colony to become the subject of many a sermon resolutions of sympathy for the sorrowing family were passed by dozens of organizations one man sat at the store telephone for two days taking down the telegrams that poured in upon alice and bruce an urgent wire arrived the morning after his death from auckland to say that fifty leading businessmen of the city would come to the funeral and later in the day a message was received to say that a big delegation of timbermen would come by launch from the wairoa after breakfast people began to flock to see him asia took upon herself the task of receiving them and showing them into the room where the body lay and seeing that they did not stay too long and of managing them generally that was something alice felt she could not face and she spent the day sitting in her own room listening to the ceaseless procession of steps up and down the hall in the afternoon a party of fifty children from the two schools with their teachers all carrying wreaths and crosses of wild flowers came awed and sobbing to look upon the face of the man who had always been the life of the school picnics the donor of most of the prizes and as an amateur conjurer the most applauded of their entertainers at the concerts at night to many of them in whose homes he had been a little god he was uncle tom the lovable deity who always had a threepenny bit to spare who made jumping bunnies for them and shadows on the wall it was this procession of children that brought to alice's eyes the only tears she shed that day and she wondered how a man who had always been so irritable with his own should be so loved by the children of everybody else it was not till the evening of that first day after the accident that mrs lyman appeared as they sat trying to eat in the dining-room they saw her drive up in her well-known little yellow gig with a quick look at her mother asia got up at once but she was surprised to see alice rise and wave her down i will meet her she said quietly asia shot a look at david bruce who refused to see anything for betty and mabel were no longer oblivious of signs so she was left to her own speculations alice and mrs lyman had met at shows where the florid black-eyed landlady of the hakuru public-house had somewhat paraded her ascendancy over the boss in a manner that had more than once disgusted his wife with him as well as with her alice had seen in mrs lyman nothing more than a vulgar harridan who was only one stage removed from a prostitute she had felt at times in the years gone by when her husband's infidelity had hurt her that she could have understood his carrying on with a beautiful or seductive woman but she never could see how a man who had been attracted to her could also be attracted by a type so utterly different from her own but her feeling about mrs lyman had altered she knew she was as vulgar as ever as she looked at her standing in the doorway dressed ostentatiously in black to show the world that she considered she had as good a right as any to mourn for the dead once alice would have called her mourning brazen but now she wondered if it were not a sign of a real courage the bay and the countryside had always forgiven the boss his sins and so far it was aware of them but alice knew from bruce that mrs lyman had been pretty generally ostracized for years by all the members of the community who claimed to be respectable alice knew the bay would condemn her but she herself felt only a pity for this primitive woman who was willing to take risks for the man she loved and who was now left bereft of the one human being upon whom she had lavished her affections for years 
she wondered if it were not greater to dare all deliberately for a thing beloved than to deny feeling as she herself had done who was to judge mrs lyman glared at alice she had hoped tom roland's wife would be in retirement she knew david bruce would receive her courteously if he were there but she had been a little afraid of asia even though asia had never snubbed her and so partly in self-defence she had brought a large cross of white hydrangeas that she had taken half a day to make feeling that that offering could hardly be refused she was amazed to see alice come forward and hold out her hand come in mrs lyman she said gently it was kind of you to come kind mrs lyman wondered if she had heard aright and her courage ferocious in attack evaporated immediately before the possibility of having nothing to do she could not even frame the first sentence she had planned all she could do was to hold out the cross that is beautiful alice went on but you would like to see him and put it with him yourself wouldn't you yes please choked mrs lyman dissolving into tears at this unexpected reception feeling that something had put her dreadfully in the wrong for the moment she followed alice to the door of bunty's room i will see that you are not disturbed for a while said alice and as she spoke she put her hand for a minute on mrs lyman's shoulder then she motioned her to go in closing the door behind her and for some time afterwards alice felt as if she had at last got into the flow of the great human current that carries all men great and small towards some goal of understanding and goodwill which they see as in a glass darkly at the end of half an hour mrs lyman stole out like a guilty thing her veil drawn over her face as she stumbled on to the veranda she came face to face with asia and bruce who were talking to people waiting there to view the body asia at once held out her hand and bruce walked round with her to help her into her gig suffering a reaction from her temporary humility mrs lyman tried to console herself as she drove home i must say i didn't expect that from er she said and er the cold thing she is oh lord why did he have to die the only thing i had i ought to have been is wife not er if things had been as they should and e knew it it was me he wanted not er and he would have married me if he could have got a divorce from er that's this world for you one of the things mrs lyman had never learned from roland had been his thoughts about his wife other than the bare fact that she did not love him nor had she ever heard from him a hint as to the possible relationships of his wife and bruce roland had had his delicacies of feeling and his points of honour poor soul said bruce speaking of her later in the evening to alice she loved him and she never looked at anyone else she will be the loneliest thing in the place for some time and she did something for him she was a good cure for polygamy david alice was shocked though she could not have said why well my dear she really has kept him monogamous i believe for the last three years don't you think that's a good thing she gave him a strange look i'm glad he had her david i'm glad he had something he really wanted she looked down at her hands they were sitting in the front room expecting no one else to come that night asia had retired a few minutes before and the house was now still it was filled with an overwhelming conglomerate smell of the flowers that had been brought in that day and although all the windows were open the air was heavy and sense deadening neither alice nor bruce had any intention of coming to themselves so soon but the mention of mrs lyman had brought to her mind something she had thought of many times that day she had guessed there would be plenty of money and already her thoughts had turned to it and to what she could do with it although she had never seen her husband's will she knew from bruce that he had made one and she knew that whether he had or not under new zealand laws the bulk of his property and money would belong to her and the children david do you know if he left her any money she asked raising her face mrs lyman she nodded not in the will i've seen the only one so far as i know he looked curiously at her her face looked whiter because of the black dress she was wearing but there was something about her eyes that held him he was interested in the way in which she was keeping herself and him in the background there's plenty of money isn't there she asked and he saw what she was coming to plenty then david i'd like her to have some to think he'd left it for her quite a good sum please can you manage that full of her own thoughts she did not see the significance of the light that shot across his eyes or notice the quality of his tone as he said shortly 
Yes. Soon she saw that his thoughts were not concentrated, as they should have been, upon the carrying out of her designs. His eyes were fixed upon her face, with one of his inscrutable expressions, a compound of hunger and tenderness, and the sternness of voluntary renunciation. She looked back at him doubtfully, till his eyes flamed suddenly, and then she rose with him, and felt herself melt into his arms. But he had not held her crushed against him for many minutes, before he remembered. Stiffening, he stood still, merely holding her face against his. Then he drew away from her. "'Oh, Lord!' he exclaimed, disgusted with himself. "'Poor Tom! I didn't mean to wait till after the funeral.' Then he regarded her reproachfully, as if she had been to blame. "'Keep away from me,' he said with a comical sternness. "'It will be at least two weeks before I have time to deal adequately with you.' For days he carried with him the memory of the smile with which she had answered his words. Roland's funeral far outshone that of Mrs. Brayton. To the people she had been a vision, a luxury, but the boss had been a plain fact, a necessity, something that went with their food and clothes and simple pleasures. The entire population for a radius of twenty miles came to it. In the mellow warmth of the still late autumn day, they sat out in the field and along the spit and on the tramway. Those who drove were in charge of a committee of men who placed them in the order of their coming to fall later into line for the Kaiwaka Cemetery, where, as the day was fine, Alice and Bruce decided that the service should be held, so that more could hear it. It took Bruce and Harold Brayton and Bob Hargraves and Asia, and the committee working under them, four hours to arrange a program that should provide for all who had not seen the coffin to see it, and to place all with some attention in the funeral procession. By midday, everybody had been disposed into groups, and their order fixed. Then they waited only for the arrival of the Auckland merchants, who had telegraphed their progress at intervals along the road. When at last their three big brakes, drawn by teams of four horses, were seen swinging round the base of Pukikaroro, there was a stir through the whole crowd of mourners, and a feeling of relief at this break in the tension. At one o'clock the procession started. Roland's coffin loaded with flowers, and followed by three buggy loads of wreaths and crosses, was carried in relays on the shoulders of the oldest workers. The first eight, which included Shiny, were men who had grown grey in his service, all having been with him since the month of his beginnings in that bush. Round them, in a sort of square, marched the other pallbearers. Immediately following them walked David Bruce, Harold Brayton, Bob Jones, who sobbed at intervals, Bob Hargraves, and Asia, the only member of his family who was present. She did not want to go, but she felt she ought to represent her mother, to whom it would have been an ordeal so trying that they decided she should not go. Following this little section of the people nearest to the dead man walked the Auckland and the Wairoa delegations. Then came the lines, over a quarter of a mile long, of engineers, sawmen, mill and bush hands, tramway and general workers, and behind them their families. The school children with their teachers followed, and after them the general public, among whom Mrs. Lyman drove, heavily veiled, in the long, straggling wave of vehicles. Seen from the house on the cliffs, the coffin was out of sight on the road at the basic Pukikaroro before the last buggies had fallen in from the field. The ministers of four of the local denominations assisted to bury Tom Rowland, and to hold him up as an example of a noble and successful citizen, pointing a moral for all in the heroic sacrifice of his end. Immediately after the funeral, a public meeting was arranged to consider plans for the erection of a monument to his memory. At this meeting it was decided without argument that the anniversary of his death should be a public holiday in the Bay School forever, and that the story should be told every year of how and why he died. There was a three-months dispute as to whether the monument should be erected on the spot where he had died or above his grave. Finally, the advocates of the cemetery won the day. End of chapter 33。34。of the story of the New Zealand River by Jane Mander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34. Once again, Alice watched by her western window for a boat to come through the gap on the river. It was the first week in May when, in the southern latitudes, nature calls a halt between the anticipative melancholy of autumn and the winter's onslaught of wind and rain and gives a consolation prize of a week or two of days filled with crystal sunshine and clear stillness 
days when life carries one along on winged feet days of dreams and visions and those wonderful ambitions that are too vast to be ever pinned down afterwards within the narrow limits of action days when one forgets death and disruption pain and disillusionment and sees only that the world is very good it was the afternoon but there was no haze anywhere and the hills high and low stood out sharp against the sky there was no motion among the forest trees and only the suggestion of a ripple on the river tom roland had been buried over two weeks and the bay had taken up its daily round again so that outwardly it seemed the same the mill hummed and screamed its dominance through the days as it had done before new vessels had come to take the places of the loaded ones beside the wharves as yet nothing had been altered but to alice it had taken on a new form and meaning it now belonged to her to her and david bruce as she looked at the low hills that lay like a band of indigo on the western horizon she remembered the time she had cried out to them seeing in them the guardians of the water highway that was to her the way out the road to a vague land of promise about which she had sometimes allowed herself to dream she had looked at it then as a prisoner in a valley dungeon might look through bars at a neighboring mountain pass wondering if he would ever go that way to life and freedom now that she knew she could go any day she chose she wondered why the keen edge of her desire had gone from her in that fortnight alice had shut down her mind for ever upon the past apart from the shock of it her husband's death had given her little to think about that she had not thought already during that summer of revelations she had made her last review of the past and its blunders it was to the future she now turned and in that turning she was aided and abetted by asia with an energy and disinterestedness that amazed and delighted her the day after the funeral asia had descended upon her mother with an avalanche of common sense and frankness that crumpled up most of alice's remaining reserves when she saw her come into her room after breakfast and close the door behind her she knew she was in for it but these interviews had been shorn of most of their terrors alice merely raised herself on her pillows and then looked expectantly at asia who sat down facing her on the bed asia who had put her own affairs into the background was now obsessed by her mother's future prospects and she was not afraid to show how she felt about it alice was to learn with much surprise in the days that followed that the years and her absences had made no difference to the girl's realization of her mother's life that the apparent difference was due to wider comprehension to a knowledge that even mothers have to work out their own salvation for themselves and to the fact that the older one grows the more one sees the two sides to every question asia tried not to be flippant or over decisive and to remember that the flowers had not yet faded on roland's grave but she could not keep her joy out of her eyes as she looked back at her mother's face against the pillow she did hope that her mother had not gone beyond realizing what the future might mean she did hope she could begin again with some of the glow of youth in her heart mother she began i hope that now at last you are going to be happy don't pretend you don't know what i mean i know you can't announce your plans to the world but you can at least tell me when you mean to marry uncle david i want to be at your wedding and having it thrown at her like that alice had blushed like a girl and had turned her face away really asia it's too soon she stammered oh don't be conventional with me mother please i can't be quiet about it i can't pretend to be mourning you know your husband was nothing to me although i appreciated his good points we both did all we could for him while he was alive now we can leave him and you don't have to wait a year to marry uncle david or any of that rot three months at the outside oh asia gasped her mother with a touch of impatience do let us arrange that for ourselves then asia had the good sense to see even while it hurt her vanity that this was really her mother's affair and that she ought to be left to plan it for herself but that started them and now that the future had got into their blood they found it difficult to keep up before betty and mabel that air of soberness that they had decided should be preserved before them for a week or two at least in the days that bruce came to dinner before he went to auckland they tried to do the things that the bay expected them to do they went round the little homes trying to make everybody feel that their world would not be wrecked they listened humbly to eulogies of roland that even he could hardly have heard without a blush and then when the girls and the children had gone back to school 
and they had seen bruce off to auckland for a week of preliminary arrangements about the will and the boss's estate they began in good earnest to plan what they would do with their money roland had left asia a sum independent of her mother's trusteeship but as his own children were all under age alice had the control of the rest of his property and was with bruce trustee for them asia was surprised to discover that her mother had already formulated well-defined plans for the future that she had thought of a maternity home in auckland for unmarried mothers and a scheme for sending them to australia and starting them in places where no one knew their story in these evidences of her modernity asia saw much more of her own influence or the effect of her own actions that week completed the rapprochement begun before roland's death at the end of it they knew that judgment was at last entirely eliminated between them that any sense of ownership that might have lingered on was dead for ever and that now their youth and age might clasp hands across the bridge of years the only thing that had troubled alice in that week of waiting for bruce to return was that she could not be as sure of asia's future as she now felt of her own but before she could frame a complete sentence on the subject asia stopped her now mother you can't settle our future because you are settling yours Alan and I are just as likely to be happy with uncertainty as you are with certainty. At any rate, we can't tell beforehand, and whatever happens to us, we won't wreck society or let ourselves be spoiled. That's all we owe the world, and if the experiment doesn't work, whether we can marry or whether we cannot, we will hurt each other as little as possible in the ending of it, and we will come through with understanding and respect. And Alice heard her without any smile of superiority or any predictions of disaster now as she sat by her window waiting for the first sign of a boat beyond the gap alice knew that she was happy she felt an immense contentment in thinking of her future life with david bruce she thought it was curious that the mental and physical restlessness that she had felt for months had entirely left her she was by no means in the fine frenzy of emotionalism that asia would have had her show as far as her marriage was concerned she was calm the sex relation had no longer for her that glamour of mystery that so stirs and fires the feelings and imaginations of youth she knew that though it promised to be in the future a very different thing from that of her life with tom roland it would be incidental balanced as it had never been in her life before she hoped as she sat waiting for the boat that in working and planning how best to spend her money she would lose finally the sense of wasted years that had so troubled her that summer the real great passion of her heart now was the idea of work with david bruce and realizing that she understood more than she had before the cementing element in the friendship of asia and alan ross when at last she saw something move against the right cliff like a fly at the bottom of a wall her speculation suddenly ceased she snatched up a field glass and strained her eyes through it she could easily distinguish the launch and two heads above the gunwale then for a minute her heart leapt to her throat in all the time she had watched for returning wanderers there had been no craft laden with the promise of this no time when love peace and happiness together sailed the swift current of expectation she knew by the sign of the foam crested wake billowing up from the bow of the boat that asia was driving it at full speed she could hear the sharp pit pit of the engine above the conglomerate noises of the mill as they came racing on something about the impudent fury of that little american machine screaming its effectiveness at the hills got into alice's blood and she sprang to her feet her eyes aflame after watching it tearing at her she turned to the mirror to see her cheeks were scarlet she smiled at herself like a girl she powdered her nose she rearranged her best old lace about the neck of her brown dress which asia had insisted on her wearing that day instead of black she told herself that she was still young that the years that the locust had eaten were no more now than an ugly dream when she looked out again the launch was level with the point below the mill where ross and lynn had lived that summer and just for a minute she wished again that she could see the end of that story too then she saw that asia was standing up by the engine she ran out on to the veranda forgetting that someone might see and interpret for himself the reason why she waved her handkerchief she waved harder than ever when she saw bruce swing his hat above his head she would have liked to have gone down to meet them but she decided that would be too conspicuous when they reached the landing stage beside the booms she went into the hall she found she could not be calm now 
that anticipation still raised a ferment in her but the minute she heard bruce's voice outside the gate she became still again asia walked off round the garden path leaving him to enter alone it seemed to alice that his brown eyes held only the old quizzical smile as they met hers that he came to her with the calm assurance of a husband rather than with the fire of a lover and the wish half formed in her mind that he would seize her but she forgot it as he drew her into her own room that one room in the house in which he had always forced himself to be impersonal there as he looked at her before throwing his arms around her she saw in his eyes what no words can ever adequately express that fierce longing of the human soul for something that it can never get in itself that something part physical and part mental that completes itself that tantalizing something that one half of humanity is always searching and that the other half is always questioning when found alice and david bruce sat in a luxury of silence and it seemed now to her that there was more magic in the language of his eyes and of his hands than there could have been in any words after all what had they to say to each other that could increase the emotion of that hour of freedom the phrases common to lovers in the first stage of mutual soul searchings would have been stale flat and unprofitable sounds in the hall first arrested their attention the children home he said raising his face from hers don't move nobody will come in she said they sat on till they heard steps outside the door mother called asia i'm putting dinner for you and uncle david in the sitting-room now do eat it while it's hot oh lord groaned bruce dinner we can't even get through a day like this without dinner and it must be hot too he sat up in disgust no use dear i've been dreaming of freedom here with you in my arms but we are not free we will have to eat dinner every day of our lives even if we want to go without it some idiot will impose it on us and if it isn't that it will be something else she laughed so spontaneously as he drew her to her feet that he looked at her i see he said i must make you laugh oftener end of chapter thirty four chapter thirty five of the story of a new zealand river by jane mander this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty five it had been a fancy of alice's after they had decided that they would move to auckland to live that they should leave the bay in the spring on the anniversary of the day they came down the river in the black punt even asia said it was a nice idea and bruce who was determined that alice should now have a few of her whims gratified said it should be arranged that way if it meant chartering the ethel specially for the purpose and it did mean that in the end for the anniversary did not fall on a regular steamer day the imaginations of the captain and the crew were fired by the magnitude of this enterprise it was the first time that the little steamer had ever been hired for a private undertaking they cleaned her up for the occasion and flew the new zealand flag which they displayed only for such events as the king's birthday empire day the owner's birthday labor day and the anniversary day of the auckland province and for long afterwards they dated various happenings as so many days or weeks before or after the week we took mrs roland and the family from the bay special trip mister nobody else on board cost em thirty pounds almost the entire female population of the bay and a few of the men gathered about the private landing at the side of the tramway and the booms to see them off the ethel was to get away about nine o'clock on the top of a high tide which allowed her to get up to the launch wharf over the mud flat the morning was fresh and clear with a winter tang still in the air and the river rippled to a light western breeze charged with ocean ozone the zinc roofs of the cottages glinted in the sun the shallow waters of the bay sparkled in patches where they were torn by the hurried movements of shoals of little fish fleeing from some enemy real or feared the white line of the sand spit glowed from the narrow channel by the mill side to the foundations of the store all round the horizon the hills high and low cut sharp into the rain-washed sky not yet warmed up by the sun pukikaroro and the bush walls behind the mill were brilliant with spring colour clumps of rata red and kofi gold and new fern greens but nowhere now was there silence and rarely could one hear the song of a solitary bird calling for its mate not a tui had been heard about the bay for years and even the enterprising wekas had been driven further into the forest 
everywhere that morning the daily business of the place was going on as usual with its accompanying agglomerate of sounds for however much the women of the bay were interested in the departure of the late boss's family david bruce had not seen that it was an occasion for sentimental interest on the part of the men only those who could like the old head carpenter conveniently leave jobs on the spit or about the store and bob hargraves now promoted to be local manager were there for last words or final instruction while the last of the baggage was being put aboard alice sat in a chair on the ethel's deck with a favoured few gathered about her in her arms she held a huge bunch of spring flowers that harold brayton with nice feeling had gathered in the now neglected old garden in the pines his quiet presentation of them had brought to alice's eyes the first of the many tears she was to shed that day hovering over her divided between tears and jokes meant to sustain her own and everybody else's courage was mrs king white-haired and fatter than ever and sure of her supreme right to claim most of the last moments of the whole family in contrast to her her daughter eliza stood silently by still in deep mourning for her drowned lover but trying to smile at her mother's sallies mrs king had a powerful rival in the person of mrs bob hargraves who had been trying vainly for a week to hide her immense pride in her husband's promotion and in the fact that he was now to have the house on the cliffs as a residence with a good deal of the old furniture and fittings intact she now stood on the other side of alice with an air of owning the whole family almost as pronounced as mrs king's on the fringe of this familiarity with a somewhat precarious hold upon it stood mrs bob jones who was uncomfortably aware that the boss's wife had never liked her although alice had always courteously acknowledged her position as the wife of one of her husband's most important and trusted heads the second indeed only to david bruce mrs bob jones felt in her secret soul that her husband should have had the boss's house for residence and she also felt in her secret soul that he would have had it but for the unfortunate fact that roland had on and off throughout the years paid her certain attentions in her husband's absence until his final complete absorption by mrs lyman she had seen sadly in the last few weeks that her chickens were coming home to roost and she wondered how much of what she had called mere flirtations with the boss had got to alice's ears and how on another part of the deck betty and mabel held court with some of their elder pupils and with those few of the better class of younger country folk who as old schoolfellows had some claims upon their friendship the two girls who had resigned their positions as teachers to follow their mother's desire that they should get degrees at the auckland university were wildly excited at the prospects of life in the city which they knew only from short and tantalizing visits to a little group of boys bunty outlined with flourishes reminiscent of his father the impression he intended to make upon the town school that would be favoured by his attendance listening to him but not with that amount of admiration he would have liked stood elsie shyly holding the hand of lily hargraves her favourite playmate asia alone had no particular group to smile upon but went from one to another on the wharf shaking hands promising not to forget them and telling them that she would write because it was kinder to lie than to tell the truth the maid knew that she was the person it was really saying good-bye to for she had told all frankly that she was going to australia to live and that she might never see the place again bruce had not packed up or said a word about going except in the ordinary sense of business and alice had said that she would often return so that the farewell emotions really centred on asia who saw that she had meant to the place more than she had ever imagined there was more than grief and a sense of coming loss mixed in the emotions of that farewell nobody had told the bay that alice and bruce were to be married soon after they got to auckland but everybody felt in their bones that something of the kind was to happen and their whispered speculations and their anticipations added a pleasant excitement to their other feelings and caused them to look for signs but in this respect they were doomed to disappointment for bruce talked on the wharf to bob hargraves till the captain called out all ashore as the last box went aboard then in the scramble of final handshakes and good-byes the excitement of seeing the gangway drawn and the ropes thrown off they forgot to see if bruce looked at alice or if she looked at him for they were trying as people do at a circus to see every way at once and to catch the eyes of all the family in turn for that last look and smile of recognition that seemed at the moment to be so important alice stood unashamed of the tears in her eyes looking back at the faces blurred before her 
and hoping that she had really been something more than a pleasant picture for them to talk of after she was gone if she could have seen into their hearts and realize how much they really did reverence her as a pure wronged and gracious lady even though their estimation of her meant an unconscious criticism of her dead husband she might have felt as asia did that it was pathetic they could feel so about a person they did not know the family group stayed still while the ethel moved out into the channel betty and mabel and the children continued to wave to their friends on the wharf till they were opposite the mill then there was a diversion the mill's siren blew three long blasts as a salute and the mill flag was run up and dipped in their honour while the men gathered on the wharves cheered loudly as they passed by swelling with pride at the greatness of the hour the captain of the ethel answered with such steam power as his machinery could muster and there ensued a duet of laughably uneven quality till they had passed the mill grounds we came in fear and trembling in glory we depart murmured bruce as if he were quoting something as he turned his amused but sympathetic eyes upon alice oh david don't make fun of it i'm sure they mean it she said wiping her eyes of course they do he answered he had looked on at the whole morning scene seeing with amusement the rivalries that had crept into the leave-taking the local jealousies the obtrusion of claims upon his and alice's favour all the ebb and flow of ordinary human feeling and motive into any situation humorous or tragic but outwardly he had shown no favours but had given as usual the impression that he was the same to every one that supreme achievement of diplomacy among average people in a small place when the ethel reached the main channel out in midstream and the faces on the wharves were no longer to be distinguished the family group dissolved bunty and elsie went off to explore the steamer in the care of the first mate and betty and mabel found seats that suited them where they might flirt unseen with the second mate who was a fresh good-looking boy they had met before alice asia and bruce continued to stand near the stern looking up the river they had forgotten the people and were thinking of the place they looked at the mountain cleaving the sky like a giant wedge of earth driven into the heavens at the gap through which tom roland had brought his dreams of wealth and glory to fruition at his self-made monument the mill roaring and screaming its efficient way through the crystal morning and the long streamers of smoke drifting away from it on the breeze at the cottages clustered by the water and at the house above the white line of cliffs now half buried by shrubs and trees i never thought i should feel like this about coming away began alice we aren't leaving it he smiled we never really leave anything behind no she admitted humbly i am bringing away all it has taught me why are you smiling asia she added catching a gleam flitting across the blue eyes i suppose you want to tell me not to be sentimental wrong mother i was thinking of the secrets locked up there in that little place the whole life in a nutshell nodding her head back at the bay in general i guess you are the only person who knows them all uncle david probably he smiled let them die said alice quietly looking out over the low swampy southern bank at the brayton pines that were now coming into view behind the green hill she thought of some that asia did not know and asia thought of some that her mother did not know and bruce thought of some that neither of them knew thinking of one in particular asia moved away from them to a place where she was out of sight for the moment she wanted to look her last upon the place in the bush above the point they were now passing where the two men had lived that summer she thought of the story the little cottage hid and of the tale it would never tell her eyes softened as she looked up into the fresh spring greens and at the dark rocks reaching out unevenly into the tide below she felt passionately that her summer story had been a great thing to her and she could only hope that it was a story that would never be spoiled she had learned perhaps too soon that lives are not finished performances or any series of rounded off experiences but a flow of endings dovetailing into fresh beginnings of abortive experiments of searches of reachings out after alluring signs of retreats hurts and disillusionments the whole apparently bound by a cohesive thread sometimes lost sight of a thread that seems to lead somewhere but about which no wise man will dogmatize she stayed alone till they reached the gap then she looked for her mother and bruce who were still where she had left them looking back up the river i wish alice was saying that i had a picture of the old black punt i always meant to have someone take one before it broke up for a family crest inquired david bruce amused at her sentimentality 
what more appropriate thing can you suggest she demanded her gray eyes lighting up his storytelling eyes alone answered her and then they turned with asia to see the last of the bay they did not speak as bit by bit the gap cut off the familiar features of the place the mill side of the river went first then the bay their old home and the mountain then the green hill the kaiwaka heights behind it with the spot where tom roland lay buried and last the black pines of the brayton farm but they knew even when the gap had cut it all out of sight that they had not left the river and the hills behind them asia felt that she would carry the freedom of them with her to australia into her work with alan ross for the intellectual dynamiting of the unthinking masses alice told herself that she would carry the inspiration of them with her into the refuge she planned for the remaking of broken lives david bruce had a fancy as he stood there that he would like to come back to them to die if only he might be buried as lost diggers were by the sweet fern on some hillside under the open wind-swept sky but even as he pictured to himself that free and pleasant ending for his bones he suspected that alice would see to it if he died first that every horrible trapping that civilization has devised for the disposal of a defenceless corpse would be heaped upon his in the name of reverence and respect and smiling at his fancy he drew alice with him towards the captain who was beginning to think it was time somebody recognized the importance of his part in the events of the day the end end of chapter thirty five end of the story of a new zealand river read by gail timmerman vaughan in christchurch new zealand two thousand and seventeen